Hi everyone. Today we are reading the story, The Power of Her Pen, the story of groundbreaking journalist Ethel E. Payne. It's hard to see. It's written by Lessa Klein Ransom and illustrated by John Para. This is a biographical story, so it's about a real person, a groundbreaking journalist. Ethel Lois Payne. always had an ear for stories. Her grandparents' front porch stories of Kentucky cotton fields and Tennessee auction blocks. Her parents' kitchen table stories of northbound trains from sharecroppers' plots. Long past her bedtime, Ethel collected the story of people who followed a path paved with dreams. In 1911, the year Ethel was born, her father, William, worked as a Pullman porter on, a rail, on railroad trains, helping passengers with their luggage and serving them in dining cars on trains that crisscrossed the country. He tossed bundles of newspaper called the Chicago Defender onto train platforms, spreading news of jobs and hope for blacks in the segregated South. Ethel didn't see her daddy much, but his firm hand ruled from a distance. Her, he and her mama, Bessie, a Latin teacher, filled their home with an equal measure of discipline and love. On Saturdays, once the house was spotless, Bessie took Ethel and her five siblings to the white side of town, where there were libraries with shelves stacked tall with books. We all know about libraries stacked with books. There, Ethel flipped through pages and memorized passages to recite to anyone who would listen. One month after Ethel started high school, her father came home after a long run on the railroads and took to bed, sick with a headache. The house hushed, the doctor was called, but nothing could be done. After William passed, Bessie worked hard to make ends meet. Ethel walked a mile to school each day. The neighborhood residents screamed and yelled and threw blacks at rocks at the black girl who dared to go to school with white people. Sometimes I stood my ground. Sometimes I got a bloody nose from fighting. But that was the way it was, Ethel later recalled. Ethel spent her school days dreaming of a life far beyond her neighborhood, except when she was in English class. There, her teacher, Miss Dixon, encouraged her writing. Her mother encouraged her at home. Ethel wrote during the day, and she read her stories aloud to her family at night. The school wouldn't let a black student work on the school newspaper, but after reading Ethel's writing, it did publish her very first story. During the Great Depression, with money even tighter than before, Ethel attended a local college with free tuition and took writing classes. When World War II began, the U.S. fought overseas while Ethel fought against racism and injustice in her own backyard. She started by organizing a women's social group at her church to make improvements in her community. Then she started a story hour for children. Next, she started a scholarship fund. After battling long and hard in Chicago, Ethel set her sights on politics in Washington, D.C., the capital. She began writing letters to newspapers, commenting on unjust laws and discrimination against black people. I was beginning to have the seeds of rebellion churning up in me, Ethel later said. By the time World War II ended in 1945, Ethel was aching to see a world far beyond the south side of Chicago. She got the chance when she answered a newspaper ad for a job overseas. With her mother's blessing, she was on her way to Tokyo, Japan. Ethel set off to explore, filling page after page of her diary up with her observations and experiences. Some pages she devoted to the stories of black soldiers. Life as a social club social director on a U.S. military base kept her busy organizing activities for soldiers. But she noticed that even in Japan, black American soldiers who had fought alongside white Americans had separate housing, the hardest jobs on the base, and almost no chance to be promoted. Ethel never imagined her voice would soon be heard in the United States all the way from Japan. 
Ethel showed her diary entries to a friend, a reporter who was on assignment in Japan. With Ethel's permission, he started shared her writing with his editor back in Chicago. Her sister was the first to call with the news. One of Ethel's articles about black soldiers stationed in Japan had made its way across the seas and into newspaper headlines, which were now in the hands of thousands of people. When her job in Japan ended in 1951, Ethel returned to her home, her family, and a job offer from the Chicago Defender, one of the only two black daily black newspapers in the country and the main source of news in the black community. It celebrated the births, graduations, marriages, and retirement news of its black citizens. Ethel once joked, you couldn't grow up in Chicago and be black if you didn't know the Chicago Defender. As the Features reporter, Ethel wrote about housing, jobs, health care, and community events. After one, one year, Ethel and her no home notebook headed to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, where politicians debated civil rights. As more and more leaders, more and more readers, sorry, opened their newspapers to read the articles written by Ethel L. Payne, the Defender's circulation grew. After three years, her editor asked, why don't you go down to Washington? Of the 204 reporters, Ethel was only one of three black journalists issued a White House press pass. It allowed her to sit in the treaty room of the White House, where the president met with journalists. Only when the president nodded could a reporter ask a question. These experienced reporters knew how to jump to their feet, hoping their voices would be the ones heard. At first, Ethel sat waiting. Then she stood. Then she waited more. Finally, President Dwight D. Eisenhower turned to Ethel and nodded. Mr. President, Ethel began shakily. shakily. Mr. President. She looked down at her carefully written question and asked the president's views on a racial incident that had occurred at the White House. U.S. Negro reporter draws Ike's wrath, a headline screamed, but Ethel kept asking questions. Ike was the nickname of uh, Eisenhower. The white press was so busy asking questions on other issues that the problems of, of, that the blacks and their problems were completely ignored, she later recalled. She asked how the president planned to enforce the Supreme Court's ruling in the Brown v. Board of Education case, which outlawed segregation in schools. I wish that all the people could understand what we want for our children, the same rights as any other human beings, she later explained. When Eisenhower left office in 1961, Ethel asked the young president, John F. Kennedy, about a civil rights voting record. When Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, she asked Lyndon B. Johnson about the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Act. And then she asked Richard Nixon questions about the lack of black people in his administration and Jimmy Carter questions on education. Ethel spent so much time in the White House that she earned the title First Lady of the Black Press. Outside the White House, Ethel interviewed protesters in Montgomery, Alabama and Little Rock, Arkansas, and marched alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Somebody had to do the fighting. Somebody had to speak up, Ethel later declared. Writing stories of the protesters' struggles was her way of doing just that. In nearly five decades, Ethel fought long and hard to bring attention to the issues that mattered most to her community and became the voice of those who had none. Ethel wrote the stories that the mainstream media refused to. It was her questions to presidents that finally made readers of all races pay attention to the plight of Black Americans. Her reporting highlighted their struggle for justice, equal pay, housing, and education. And in her role of informing her readers, Ethel created awareness and activism in the flight, fight for civil rights for people across the globe. Always with an ear for stories, Ethel had asked the questions and demanded the answers for people whose path were paved with dreams. I've had a box seat on history, Ethel once said, and that's a rare thing.
And that's the end of the story, boys and girls, but I will read the author's note. As a young girl, I dreamed of becoming a hard-nosed reporter, sniffing out stories, uncovering cases of crime and corruption. But then in high school, I attended a one-week workshop at a college in Boston designed for students interesting, interested in entering journalism field. We met with local reporters and toured the floors of the Boston Globe newspaper. We created our own newspaper, for which I wrote several articles. But soon I realized that journalism would not be my chosen career. It takes a certain kind of grit and fearlessness I didn't yet possess at the age of 17. Known as the first lady of the black press, Ethel Lois Payne possessed these qualities from the day she was born on August 4th, 1911. Her passion for stories and truth and justice allowed her to be an ardent observer of the world and the people around her. When the mainstream white press ignored stories of importance to the black community, Ethel used her pen and her voice to report on the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks, the plight of unwed mothers, race relations, and the adoption crises for black children. Writing for the Chicago Dependent newspaper, she did so with authenticity authenticity and grace. Her pointed questions to numerous presidents elevated civil rights issues to the national agenda and in turn helped to speed along the slow wheels of change by holding elected officials accountable to their black constituents. And this is something that's still important, still needs to happen today. In 1954, as one of the first African-American White House press correspondents, she pushed President Dwight D. Eisenhower so hard for answers to her questions on desegregation, immigration, and anti-discrimination legislation or laws, he stopped calling on her during press briefings. But it was her questions that prompted change in the form of Eisenhower's public stance in action on desegregation legislation. Her reporting extended far beyond the U.S. She traveled outside the country to report on black soldiers serving in the Vietnam War, the Asian African Summit in Indonesia, the Civil War in Nigeria, and apartheid in South Africa. Upon her retirement from the press corps, President Lyndon B. Johnson presented her with the pens he used in the signing of the Civil and Voting Rights Act. As she aged, Ethel never slowed. She began teaching at the School of Journalism at Fisk University and became the first um, black woman commentator on a national television network. Ethel Payne passed away on May 28, 1991, and left behind a legacy of speaking for the unheard and shining a light on injustice throughout the world. In 2002, she was one of four groundbreaking women journalists featured on a U.S. postage stamp. When it comes to issues that really affect my people, I think that I am an instrument of change. Lisa Klein Ransom. Thanks for listening.